I uh, was professionally working as a waiter at TGI Fridays at the time, um, where I had lots of flair, I might add. And, uh, uh, and I actually, I knew uh, some of the people involved with Mystery Science from uh, doing stand-up comedy. And I got this uh, call from Josh Weinstein, who also was on the first season, and he did stand-up as well. And he said, um, you want to come down and do this typing for this weird show that we're working on? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that, because Fridays isn't all that rewarding. So uh, I went down and uh, hit it off with the guys, and I had been with them uh, ever since. He's being modest, because uh, he came into the room, and, and uh, everybody said, feel free to throw in a joke if you've got something in mind. And, and we'd be throwing out these sort of middling, crummy, occasionally nice jokes, and then every time Mike would say something, he would knock the ball out of the park. And oh, he would just, you know, the room would just collapse in laughter, and we'd have to stop the tape and keep on moving. And then we realized, you know, Mike is one of the six or seven funniest people on the planet, and maybe we should make him a writer. And in no time, he was the head writer. And uh, he's, he's lying, but thank you. The way I came to Mystery Science Theater was kind of odd, and I feel sort of privileged to have been with the thing from its very, very beginnings to its bitter and tragic end. <laughs> um, of course, it's immortal since it's on Rhino Home Video. <laughs> Uh, I was working with uh, my pal Jim Mallon at um, KTMA TV 23, the bottom rated UHF independent station in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And um, the, the place was a shambles. It was an underfunded station, but they had a studio and they had cameras. And, uh, and Jim and I knew we had means to do TV comedy, which is what we'd always wanted to do. And we did a few um, of our shows of our own, and we were inviting local stand up comics to be on, uh, on the station in little showcases. And uh, we invited Joel Hodgson to uh, throw some ideas um, to us. And he came, up, he came up with some sketches of these odd-looking tinker toys uh, sitting in a row of movie theater seats uh, in front of a, a screen with a monster movie or something like that going on. And he had this sort of plan that he would be kind of like the guy from the movie Silent Running, you know, captive with these robots on a ship headed nowhere. And, uh, and the station manager didn't care. He didn't even know what we were doing in there. We, were, you know, we have all these sets out there, and we're, we're stealing movies from the film library. And he'd come in, and he'd jingle his change in his pocket and say, eh, I don't know what the hell you guys are doing, but you just keep it up there. And, and, uh, and the station, went before, right when we um, sold the show to the network, uh, we found out that the station was going bankrupt. So the timing could not have been better. The station was changed and transformed. It was actually bought by a Christian broadcast group, so the show would not have survived. The designing of the robots was sort of, um, uh, w let's say it was haphazard. Um, actually, the, the truth of it is that Joel stayed up the night before the first show. He had not built a single robot. <laughs> and, uh, and he just, his way of doing it was to dumpster dive or go to St. Finney's and get all these old broken toys. And what, you know, the George Lucas guys called kit bashing, and Joel was doing that for a long time. And a hot glue gun and a couple of screws, and uh, he put together crude versions of what were to be the, uh, the three robots. Many, many hundreds of pounds of hot glue over the course of our... Oh, Lord. Gaffer tape, hot glue, staples, yes. string, and drywall screws. Or that's yeah. what the entire thing was held together by. A stiff wind could have knocked any of those sets over. All the interns would get their job running the door, and it was like the, the set was crammed into this little industrial space, and so the interns would have to be back in this little one-foot space, and they couldn't hear anything, they couldn't see anything, it was pitch black. All they knew was this little light would flash, and they'd close the doors. And then after about three hours, we'd say, you can come out now! They come out sweating and like, did we do okay? It was like the worst job we could have ever created. <laughs> and the tunnel, all the doors, uh, the the down the way. The first one that we did is uh, the, the thing was truly only about four feet high. So we had a camera on a tiny little handmade dolly with a 12 foot two by four, and we just ran it down this thing and 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 uh, went through these doors. And again, every intern, everybody in the whole building came in to operate a door to have one of these torches going, and uh, or put a little radio controlled beetle running through the the floor there and. Um, it was a concerted effort, and it was so cheap. That's the thing. But I love the way it turned out. The way it got onto the network was sort of interesting. At the time uh, we were developing the show, Joel was doing some work for one of the new 24-hour comedy channels. There were two of them, one called The Comedy Channel and one called Ha. And they were in savage competition. But what this meant was they, the, between the two of them, they needed 48 hours of programming a day 
and they had huge gaps in the schedule, and otherwise they were showing reruns of like, I don't know, My Mother the Car or CPO yeah. Sharky. And, I mean, just the lamest sitcoms that you've ever seen in your life. Um, and Joel had been doing some sort of consulting work with them, working with uh, uh, an act called the Higgins Boys and Gruber, and um, Dave Higgins, who's been, she was on, he's on um, Malcolm in the Middle, Oh, that's right. And, yeah. um, and Steve Higgins, who was a producer for Saturday Night Live for many years. And Gruber, so, who's the Naked Trucker. That's which, right. I don't know, that's a, a long-running show out in L.A. If you now. haven't seen The Naked Trucker, go see The Naked Trucker. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so we had that in with Joel. And Joel had this pit bull of an agent um, who was just, he, he was the sweetest guy on the outside, but then when he'd get into a negotiating situation, he was just savage. I mean, he was the, the most menacing guy I'd ever met, which is perfect for us, because we're just loopy Midwesterners. He was a screamer, too. Oh, man, was It'd he ever. It always be sort of embarrassing to be on a three-way call with him. <laughs> this is embarrassing what you're offering. I'm going to hang up this phone right now, just screaming at the top of his voice. And yeah. We're just sitting there, wow, I like this guy. So we had these sort of advocate angels on our side there a little bit. Um, people at Comedy Central who already knew who we were, and Rick, uh, who was an amazing uh, agent. And um, they needed all of this, this programming, and we were perfect for it because we were a two-hour show. Now, they tried to get us to move to New York to do it. Yes. And we said no. And they said, well, here's what you can do. You can fly to New York on Monday. We can shoot the show, and then you can be back in Minneapolis by Friday. And, uh, that was no good. Yeah. That was no good. So, but it, you know, having the uh, uh, the main advantage of our show being that we were long. That's what, you know. If nothing else, we're long. It was volume. Yes. It's a volume discount. Sheer too. volume. I think staying in the Midwest was crucial to the fact that the show yeah, did so. Absolutely well. essential. Yeah. There's just no way we could. I mean, the th the the point of view is so Midwestern and so uh, you know it it, it had to be. Uh, and also, you know, we would have met the people that we were making fun of. That was always sort of alarming when we go out to Emmy Award ceremonies or something. You see, oh, that's that one we slammed, you know, really bad. So it was also for our safety it was best to stay in Minnesota. And a nice bonus is that none of these network executives wanted to come out to the Midwest. They thought it's just this savage tundra where, you know, people have mullets and, and drink beer all the time and beat each other. Wh which uh, is, you know, true. It's pretty much so, the truth. I, I, but, uh, so we'd, we'd, we'd get one visit out of the, the network executives, you know, and then it would just be, yeah, this place is great. Well, 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 you guys seem to be doing a good job, you know, so we'd never have them visit again. It was perfect. When we were on Comedy Central, we had minimal interference with how we wanted to do the show. Um, when we went to the Sci-Fi Channel, because it was USA Network and it was more of a hierarchy, things started to change a little bit, and they wanted us to have a story arc. We said, we can't have a story arc. We're a puppet show. <laughs> we don't need a story arc. All we need is an excuse to tell jokes. And, and the, shows, the shows ran out of order. So we'd have a story in the show that would just, and then the, another part of the show, uh, the story would come you know, in the wrong place. After three shows, they'd start, or four shows, they'd start rerunning again. So the story was instantly out of sequence, even though they insisted the network was really sort of in trouble at that point. That so you'd sad. watch a show where Kevin is, you know, an ape in one, and then he's in, he's a Roman, you know, <laughs> he's a Roman <laughs> soldier in the next. What? What happened here? To be honest, we did have discussions about what exactly it was going to be. And I don't know if we ever settled on it. No, <laughs> stop, we didn't. Stop looking at me. I'm making up a good story. It's good. Keep no, going. it was, uh, uh, you know, we always just wanted to be funny, be a stream of funny. And, uh, you know, every now and then a, uh, an interviewer would ask, uh, I remember Joel used to like to come up with theories for what the show was. And then you'd read his theories and you'd go, that's what we're doing? I don't, it didn't. He'd come didn't up with them right on the yeah, spot. So and then would be a different one every time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't yeah. know if we ever settled on what the core of the show was. I, I think it was just mucking around with the culture, you know, having as much fun with the culture in this odd little Kukla, Fran, and Ali universe that was invented around this. So and, you know, in a way, it was sort of a tribute to all those old creature feature hosted movie shows with the characters, and every local big market would have one of these things, like um, Sven Gulli in Chicago. Yes, and Son yeah. of Sven Gulli. Son of Sven Gulli, yes. of course, which is what I remember. And there was a nod to that. And it was really simply a way of having the most fun you could with a TV show. But I, I remember one principle we wanted to, to sort of keep was that it could be adults would get the, the humor and then children could also watch and not, you know, and not have to participate in the 
naughtier bits, as it were. And we always tried to, that was at least a principle that we tried to keep intact, is that kids could be sitting with their parents and, and the jokes would fly over their head and, you know, so. And the typical writing process was we, uh, there was a long time where Frank Conniff selected the film and it was always this moment when, you, when we'd come in for the first writing session, everybody would be there. It would be, uh, that would be sort of the great moment, like, oh, what are we doing today? And everyone would crowd into the, into the writing room and we'd start. And then uh, you'd notice for this first uh, day of writing, which went about eight hours, you'd notice people sort of slowly creeping back out of the writing room, like Jim, who's, I have uh, producing stuff to do, because it was so fun at first, but it took so long. But we would do uh, this one long writing session, and then we would write the host segments on the next day, because we sometimes needed to go off of the, you know, the things from the movie itself. And then on the third day, we'd write again. And, uh, and after that, it sort of went into, into production. Yeah. Yep. You just need to know that we would spend all day going through one pass of this film, starting and stopping and writing comments. So you get to know these films better than the filmmakers did in some ways. Um, and, and while this was happening, in the meantime, as quickly as we could after writing the host segments, we'd ship a list of props and special effects that we needed to the editor and the production people who were always caught off guard and way behind and we gave them way too much work to do in a very short period of time. Uh, then after we had the scripts in, um, Paul and Mary Jo and, uh, and Frank and other writers of ours would sit down and assign all of these jokes we had to lines of time code in the movie. And that's why it always looked like we were so good at what we did. It had to do with the fact that it was so carefully ordered and then we would rehearse um, uh, Which got to be longer, the rehearsal process got to be longer and longer as the show went on because we realized if we just really keep working on this, it's so much better. Because there was a point where you just can't see Joe Don Baker's face anymore and you just don't want to, I don't want to work on that joke because it's the one where he's this big sweaty mug and so you kind of give up and, and, uh, and we finally learned if you just muscle through it and really give that a lot of time, it'll be that much better. And we'd have a day of rehearsal on the production, and then we'd shoot, in one day, we'd shoot uh, the Dr. Forrester Mad Scientist stuff and the, Mad, and the Satellite of Love stuff. Then the next day, we'd go in and spend the morning rehearsing, and then have a big, meaty lunch. And so we were really tired when it came to performing the movie, and we were yeah. bloated and gassy, and, and it was, so it was perfect. I, I, I think you were gassy. I don't oh, know. I'm the only one who ordered the giant lunch, I'm sure. No, yeah. no lunch was huge. Lunch was one of the biggest events around uh, Best Brains. Lunch is, I, I attribute a lot of our success with the show to the quality of the lunches we had. I used to sometimes think that the schedule was rigorous. And I, my, my, my wife, Bridget, who also worked on the show, when she was at home, she used to tease me because I'd call from the set and it would be like 5.30 and say, well, this seems like it's going to go a long time. And then I'd show up at the door at like 6.15. You know, <laughs> you are such a whiner. You work in TV and it's like the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. So uh, it felt sometimes, it felt rigorous. But then you realize this is like a dream job. And we never, that we always wanted to keep our lives in, uh, intact outside of the show. So it was pretty easy. It was always important for us to have a life beyond the TV show and not have to sit in a bungalow in you know, in Hollywood on a studio lot, day in and day out, going from writing to producing and then back to writing and doing that cycle. We give ourselves ample vacation time. Uh, we do six shows, or six weeks of work and then have a week off. Uh, it, it was That's actually nice. it was, it's wonderful. And at first, of course, when we were first gearing up the show and figuring out what it was, we spent a whole lot more time doing it. And that was when we were having 12 and 14 hour days and six day weeks. Uh, but we got rid of that crap as quickly as we could. We were pretty uh, uh, democratic in the writing room, and there there were times where we would pair off. And uh, I do know that that Paul and and Paul Chaplin and Mary Jo Peel enjoyed a nice sporting. Uh, they would kid about their feuds. Sort of a Tracy and Hepburn thing. Yes, yes. So those two would uh, would bicker in humorous ways always. But beyond that, I, I don't think it formed off into any you know armies. It was all pretty much. The uh, the one thing that was always fun for the writers was since Mike did most of the musical arranging, since he actually had musical talent and could play the piano. This much talent. Uh, but we'd all get to work with Mike on a song. Everybody, everybody loved to do the songs. The songs were like the most fun you could have, was to sit down and write a song. And generally, unless it was something a cappella, 
it would take Mike's talents to arrange it. And even then, it would take Mike's talents to arrange it. So everybody got a chance to collaborate with Mike, I think, on a song. And it was, was it was always a treat. We didn't really have cultural quotas. And one thing we tried not to do was to be too topical. Because yes. then it would really date the show. And we wanted the humor to be more general and universal. And so we became a drift net. Say we're doing a show in 1996. We were a drift net for every bit of the culture that happened in 1996 all the way back to, you know, I don't know, 1878 or, <laughs> right. you know, we probably had references to Henri Rousseau at certain points, so. Um, yeah, we, we tried not to be too topical. Yeah, but occasionally we would succumb and you'd give in because it just seemed too perfect. And then you'd see it two years later and you'd go, oh, I wish we hadn't done that. I wish we had had the willpower, so. Yeah, our, our, our loathing for current pop stars, undeserving pop stars, would come out. So we'd make fun of Adam Duritz, or the guy yeah, who was right, the yeah. uh, the lead singer for the Crash Test Dummies. And so <laughs> it really becomes obscure after a while, because who the hell remembers the lead singer for the Crash Test Dummies, except he had that voice. Oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun. I think the sketch writing, people got really excited about that. And uh, there was this phenomenon with the movie writing, again, where it was so, the morning session would just be loaded with jokes. And then it would be two in the afternoon, and we'd all be slumped down in our chairs, and we'd be, you know, logy from lunch, and, and there'd be, <laughs> like, no comment anywhere. And you'd have to be rewinding the film. And it did really get to be work at that point. Yeah. But the sketch writing was always a little more sprightly all the way through, I think. Yeah. Writing was always rigorous, especially the movie writing was always rigorous. Mm -hmm. and, and we'd also break off onto our own when we'd write the sketches. And so everybody would get to sort of put their spin on something and, and have something to be proud of. And, uh, and I think that was always reflected in the sketches. When it came, to, I, I always made, it's like different types of fun that we were able to have. You know, we had the fun of doing the movies and that would get sort of tiring. And then we'd write the sketches and you'd be done with that. And then we'd go and shoot the things. And then we go perform the film, you know, in front of the blue screen. And there were like four different varieties of fun that we got. And of course, there was always lunch. It was so a buffet of fun. It all comes back to lunch, though. Yes. But there was a moment where um, you presented your sketch to the, to the rest of the writing room, and then all the production people would come in as well. And that was always a fun moment, too. It was like a little show and tell. Here's the thing that I did, you know, which in the, in the normal writing process, you were obviously always throwing out jokes. But was, this was like, this is my little secret sketch. And so that was fun, too. The movie picking process was, uh, the way it was done changed over a while, but it, it generally meant a lot of pain of some person or another sitting in a room and watching a lot of rejects. Um, it was um, Frank for the longest time. <laughs> Frank. He loved it, though. <laughs> and Frank would, the, the process for a while with Frank was uh, he would pick every Coleman Francis movie that was ever made. That was pretty much the process for oh, half a year. He loved the, the, the worst movies. So whatever the most bizarre and sort of uh, empty movies there are, that was Frank. But, uh, but we all got to have a say in it, so. Yeah, it's true. But I think when it came down to it, there were generally like 20 films looked at before a film was actually picked that would work for the show. So it, it was rugged. It was really tough. And when other people started taking over for Frank's work and reviewing movies, you know, people would just come in cross-eyed and say, my god, I've just seen the, the black tower at the bottom of humanity's soul, and I'm sick, I'm just sick. It's, some of these movies were just wretched and horrible and downright made by Satan, I'd say. <laughs> yes. Made Roman Polanski look like a Christian movie maker, you know? <laughs> but we got, there was a moment where we got to the, we got so good at, at uh, reviewing the movies that if there'd be five of us in the room and you'd plug the thing in and you'd see one credit come up and you go, no, and it would just be rejected. <laughs> there was no need to go through the whole thing. You'd see a name or something, you just go, no, no, oh, off limits. Don't. I remember now that hillbilly teenage uh, oh, adult, I don't want to say the name because some of you freaks out there <laughs> will try to find this film and that's just wrong. And I don't know how we got it, but we got it out of the place as quickly as possible. It was about child brides. And, uh, and it was Which just... gives you a clue to the title of the film. But, um, and it was all set in Crackerville, and it's like they actually hired, you know, people who, um, who uh, lived there rather than actors. And it, it, I, I, need, I had a good cry after that one. And then uh, a little liquor and a shower. We should break tape and shower right now, in fact. Yeah. It's so, ugh, ugh, so, But ugh. beyond what we did, where we, people say we, we did the cheesiest movies ever done, 
there are far worse. We only showed you the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. It's much worse than yeah. this. And the fans have always been a part of the history and the evolution of the show. And uh, you know, there's there's some kooks out there, but this, by and large, uh, fans are are normal people. You know, smart, sassy, like us, and just you know, really loving the show. And we get lots of positive feedback. Besides, you know, the people would send us like teeth or toenails in the mail. You know, for every one of yeah. those, we'd get a hundred very nice letters from from relatively normal people. But I, I think yeah. the fans helped a lot because uh, I think executives were frightened of them. They didn't know what. There's this thing called the internet, and there's people who really love the show, and if we cancel it, who knows what will happen. So I liked having that sort of backing us up, like, yeah. hey, we got all these scary people that you don't know about. The, the fans were able to scare the living hell out of the network people because they knew that if they did some little change or twitch <laughs> to the program, they would simply clog up the fax machine with complaints, and these people couldn't conduct business sometimes because the phone would keep going. And the fans helped, you know, they put a full page ad in Variety, um, yeah. hoping that we would get the movie going, Mystery Science Theater, the motion picture going. And, uh, and that was, it's just, you know, it's wonderful. I mean, how many shows have a fan base, They're, they not only like the show, they not only write you, but they will go out of their way and they'll spend their own good money to make sure that they can keep on watching the show. That's pretty cool. I think the internet really helped people connect. You know, I, I remember when I first saw David Letterman, uh, like the morning show that he did, and then when he first started his show, it just seemed like nobody else was watching the show, and it had this sort of cool feeling to it. And I think that uh, happened with Mystery Science, where, wow, I can't believe the show is on the air, and, and I wonder if there's other people who even know it exists, and, and I think that's how the Internet helped connect these people. So it was, it was pretty cool. And they started on the Internet really early. I mean, there were members of the well who were on these uh, Usenet uh, news groups. Uh, what was the one? Uh, R-A-T-M-M, Radom, uh, Rec Arts Television. Um, something mystery science theater. Yeah. So it, it made up the the lyrics there. Uh, I mean the the name of the name of the show there. Um, and these pe they were passionate about. It. There was a group AOL Misty's Camp was one group, and then the Radom group was another group. And uh, and still, I mean, people meet over the internet to chat after the show is on on Saturday mornings, and uh, and they'll have their own mini conventions in different parts of the country. Well, we always, I think that the changes of, of cast members were always, you know, somewhat devastating to the show personally, but we always felt that the core of the show was really the movie, and, uh, and that was always so good, and we, I think we got better and better at, at doing that, yeah. that part of it. And uh, uh, so I, d I don't know if, if we ever, uh, if any cast change caused us to really change the direction of the show, we always just felt like we got that movie just kind of as the anchor. It was always, it truly always about the movie. I mean, that's, that, that's the heart and soul of the show. And um, uh, if we had very capable people taking over these roles, which was really nice. You know, Mike taking over from Joel brought a different spin, sort of freshened the show a little bit, but didn't drastically change it. You know, this is much better than the whole Dick Sargent debacle. You know, yeah, that was a nightmare. Oh, I don't, I I don't even know which guy is which. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. But um, And then I, it, one of the hardest things, I think, was, uh, was Bill Corbett coming in and being a writer and taking over for Crow um, from Trace, who was so good. And it gave that puppet its, uh, truly its own personality. And so he didn't get, uh, Mike got to be uh, his own character. Because he didn't, you didn't play Joel. Thank right, God, that right. would have been a little strange. <laughs> yes. um, but Bill had to come in, and and he started off trying to honor Crow, and then he started to uh, imbue a Crow with his own style, and it came across. And and the thing I loved about Crow when Bill took over is that suddenly Crow had a shorter fuse than he'd ever had before, <laughs> and he was prone to fits of rage. Uh, not that Bill is anything like this at all, but but he did bring that quality to him. Crow was a little less patient with he Tom. Was, he was less patient with the movies, too. <laughs> yes, it's like. true. It's true. So it was di different facets, and I think it, it did enliven the show. It enlivened the show for us to have things change. Um, so, and I, and I think we'd, maybe we'd lose some audience members, um, you know, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know. That happens, you know. Yeah. Look what happened with Martin Luther. 
what was his show? Well, he changed things <laughs> up, and, and, and the church lost a lot of audience oh, members, right, you know? right, right, right. So, not right. that we're equating ourselves with Martin Luther, but... Uh, Zingley, maybe. Yeah, but <laughs> John Knox, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> okay. I do have favorites now, but it's always, it's, it's so hard because people always ask that, and your memory, I can't remember the things because they were, there, there was that pain, and you're trying to get past it. Uh, but now, with so much distance on it, you can see something and just sort of enjoy it for what it is. And I just, uh, I just watched the girl in gold boots, <laughs> and we just, you know, my family, we thoroughly enjoyed it. It was like this is a funny episode, and you know, the jokes that you you didn't remember at all, they were fresh. You know, it's like uh, uh, having a short memory is good because <laughs> I, I I'm seeing these things for the first time, and so I like that one. Yeah. It's hard for me to pick out what is my favorite because I like different shows for different reasons. And some the movies were miserable, but I was really proud of the job we did of making it funny from our end. Um, and that's the Coleman Francis films are some <laughs> examples of those where, where they're almost unwatchable. And Manos, The Hands of Fate was, it was just almost unwatchable. Um, and then there were movies that were so absurd on their own, like Space Mutiny. Is uh, it's just so silly on its own, and the continuity is terrible, and the acting is terrible, and the the hero is a slab beefcake or bolt rip rock or whatever <laughs> yes. you call him was was so patently ridiculous that the movie itself did a lot of our work for us. Uh, so there are like those two varieties. So it's hard for me to pin down one because I liked so many of them. So what does the road have? What is in the future for Michael J. Nelson? Tell us, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James Lipton. <laughs> uh, since the show ended, I have uh, worked on, on books, uh, Mike Nelson's movie Mega Cheese, Mike Nelson's Mind Over Matters. It wasn't my idea to have it be the Mike Nelson's thing, by the way. Uh, and Death Rat, my, my novel. And I've written uh, some screenplays. There's one that's sort of in the works as an animated thing. The danger of this thing is you can never talk about it. I hate that. You can't mention what you're working on, but I'm doing an animated film and uh, working on uh, several other top secret projects. <laughs> <laughs> no! Bow down before me! <laughs> Kevin? Uh, well, um, since the show ended, this is the first time I've had pants on. <laughs> I, just can, I can attest that is quite true. Been in a hotel room, um, Tokyo Hotel on Ohio Avenue in Chicago, and drinking and wearing no pants. <laughs> Living the Bukowski lifestyle, folks. That's yeah. me. No, um, uh, since the show ended, the, the thing that I'm happiest with is uh, I got to write my first book called A Year at the Movies, One Man's M Film Going Odyssey, available from HarperCollins Books, uh, and a good discount on Amazon.com. Anyway, um, I uh, promised myself, and uh, my quest was to um, go to a theater and see a movie every day of the year for an entire year, and the book is a chronicle of that. And I traveled the world in order to do it. I got to see the smallest movie theater in the world in uh, Australia. Um, I went to the Midnight Sun Film Festival in Arctic Finland, and I went to the South Pacific uh, Cannes Film Festival, showed movies on the beach in Mexico. It was, it was a great job, you know? And I thoroughly enjoyed writing the book, and so I'm looking to write um, some more books. I'm actually developing a TV version of what I did um, in the book a year at the movies in order to show people all the cool alternatives there are to the multiplex, which I think would be a great service for humankind if I could do that. And um, I am a uh, film commentator for Weekend Edition Sunday on National Public Radio. Occasionally I'm up against Elvis Mitchell, that know-nothing toad. He's a hack. Actually, I like Elvis Mitchell very much, so I'm sorry, Elvis. Uh, but again, just... Uh, you know, trying to stay uh, um, away from an actual job and trying to stay as far from Hollywood as possible, which I think is really important. Michael, if you could be a form of polymer, what uh, form of polymer would you be? Polyvinyl chloride. To us tonight, you are polyvinyl chloride, Michael. Thank you, James. James. Thank you. Thank you.